Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this evening's event. My name, oh wait, before I start, um, I would like to announce that we will be recording this event to post it tomorrow for those that were not able to make it today but wish to be a part. But if you have any reservations about recording it, please let us know directly in the chat and we will not post it if you are not okay with it. But my name is Sabrina Kasingri and I am a senior at Stetson University. And together with Kaylee Klutt, who could not be here, unfortunately, we are the co-chairs and student leaders of the Take Action Institute this year, 2022 to 2023. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit, bit about the Take Action Institute. It is a resource center that serves as a collaborative space for students, activists, community partners, and educators to share knowledge guided by the lessons of the Holocaust and vision for a just and caring community. Take Action Institute supports student movements that take action against all forms of prejudice and bigotry. And all this is possible through the amazing support and sponsorship by the Holocaust Memorial Center and Educational Center in Orlando. And now I'd like to introduce Milani Ellis, who will be taking us through this event tonight. Milani Ellis is a sophomore at the Center for International Studies and dual enrollment student at Dr. Phillips High School. She hopes to obtain a master's in international studies with a minor in political science to meet her future career goal as a diplomat. Milani is passionate about many issues in her community concerning the mistreatment of minorities. This ultimately led to her making the decision to join Take Action Institute as the co-chair for the Civic Engagement, Equity and Justice Network. Over to you, Milani. Thank you, Sabrina, for that wonderful introduction. Good evening, everyone. I hope you are all excited because we have a great event planned for you all. Tonight, I'm here to introduce a very special guest by the, er by the name of Eric Vaughn and his pronouns. Mr. Vaughn is very active in the community, being the director of programs at Community Tampa Bay. Additionally, he is a professor at the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg, where he teaches jur community journalism and writing food courses. Mr. Vaughn also worked as the director of LGBTQ and policies for the New York Department of Education, where he assured students are affirmed and safe in schools across New York City. Mr. Vaughn is also passionate about, about food, literature, and social injustice. Youth hold a special place in his heart because he spent several years as a high school teacher. Mr. Vaughn also spends his time within several nonprofits dedicated to the empowerment of youth voices and advocacy. In his free time, Mr. Vaughn enjoys riding, traveling, and bike riding across St. Peter, around, excuse me, St. Petersburg. As you can see, he is very involved in the community and making a change. Let's give it up for Mr. Vaughn, everybody. Oh, that's awesome. You made me sound so important. Um, you are. I, I don't know. Um, I am going to, can you allow me to share my screen? I have a little little slide for you for you all, just introducing myself. And first of all, before even before I'm able to do that, let me see if I can share it. Perfect. Um, let me see. I wanted just to say thank you for letting me be here today. I am super, super excited to share this day with you all, to share some time with you all. Um, we are in a crazy time. Um, I just left a, I just left a presentation not too long ago this, this evening, actually, uh, where they were talking about some of these bills that are going through the state of Florida. So I think it's really important that we have this time together to talk about what's happening in our amazing state of Florida, despite what we're gonna talk about today, despite how I might roll my eyes when I say a few different things that are happening. I still love this state so much. I, um, Florida is, I didn't grow up here, but it's definitely a home for me. This is, is, is my home and I, and I love this state. So that's why I'm super passionate about it. And I care so much um, because I know that we can make a change and make a difference in what we do. These conversations that we have, I think they really, really play a key part in what we do. So we're gonna say, uh, I don't know, can you see my uh, PowerPoint? 
Okay, so um, what what can we say now? Um, we're going to take a, a look at the controversial bill, 15 House Bill, Florida House Bill 1557. Um, it's labeled the Don't Say Gay Bill. Um, we're going to talk, talk about some of the implications that it might have on education and youth throughout the state of Florida. Um, love that Disney uh, is now in support. So I had to, I found that picture and definitely had to use that. Um, so who I who am I? I'm Eric, pronouns he, him, his. Um, before working at Community Tampa Bay, doing conversations like this around the community, I was managing, uh, directing LGBTQ program and policy for New York City Department of Education, where I created policies that are completely different than the ones that we're going to be talking about today um, to affirm LGBTQ students in the state to make sure that they had access to the correct bathrooms, to make sure that the curriculum was being taught and inclusive, um, making sure that we weren't just using uh, Sally and Sam go to up the hill stories we're teaching at, at kindergartners that kindergartners uh, that we were also using. Uh, um, all genders in our storytelling, all genders and examples in classrooms. So that was a really cool gig. But again, Florida is home for me and I miss Florida so much and the work needed to be done in Florida. So I came back here and got an amazing job at Community Tampa Bay where we do exactly that. We go into these schools that don't understand the importance of these conversations, that don't understand the importance of inclusion per se, or the, or the impact that just changing when you're giving examples as educator, just changing the pronouns of a of a character to they them instead of just using the, the binary character, the binary pronouns, um, how much difference and how much of an impact that can have on the culture of a school and of the environment. Um, besides though, besides work, which I spend a lot of time doing, um, I'm also like a community activist. I really think that the key to change is local. Like we do, we make change locally, and then that has a bigger impact. So I do a lot of local community work. Um, I still teach at USF. It's part time now. Um, so I teach food writing and food photography. That's like a passion for mine. So that does not feel like work, even though it is still work. And I just recently adopted a two year old. So I have that under my belt too. Um, a two year old little guy named Zorro. Um, so that's who I am. I'm super excited again that you are welcoming me into your homes on Sunday that you all decided to spend Sunday evening with me. You could be watching the Oscars, but we're here. Nobody watches the Oscars anymore either. I found that out today. It has gone down by like, it was 60, 60 million people in 2019. And now it's like 5 million people expected to watch it this year because they're not inclusive enough. So um, we're seeing that all over. Inclusive Inclusivity is super, super important in our world. Um, and oh, somebody said congratulations on my adoption. Thank you. Inclus inclusivity is super important, and representation matters. Um, so let's just get started. I'm gonna I'm gonna go. Over, I'm gonna just work through a few slides with you all. Then we'll have some time to have some conversation. Um, so exactly what is this bill? It's called House Bill One Five uh, Fifteen Fifty Seven. Uh, it's labeled the Parental Rights and Education Bill. Um, What's in this bill? I It's a long, long, long bill. I picked out some of the key things. I know you've all heard of the Don't Say Gay bill. It's print trending, trending really, really big now. Um, I Like I said, I just left a meeting where they were talking about this bill. I just, I can't have a conversation in the state of Florida or otherwise where this thing doesn't come up, especially otherwise. People and old colleagues of mine in New York are um, asking what's going on. Um, unfortunately, we are one of the first states to pass this bill. Well, we're one of the first states to pass this bill, but other states are now looking at this bill and saying, seeing what they can do. Um, Florida is a leader in that right, where we like, do some really crazy stuff at times. And then like people look at us and they're like, oh, let me out crazy you. So that happens occasionally. Um, so I want to go over some like high level stuff. And again, this bill is like packed with um, a lot of a lot of detail in there, but really a lot of that detail is just kind of to throw you off on what they're actually trying to say. So I kind of broke it down into three important things that we want to talk, I want to talk to you about. Now, the first fact that's in this bill is that this bill limits classroom interaction on sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, the fine print on that is that what they have in the bill that is hidden in there is that it may not, uh, um, 
may not occur in K through third grades or so the com these conversations may not occur in K through third grade or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate. So what that means is that they're saying that they want to limit the and they want to limit the conversations around sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and they're saying that it should be K through third grade, right? So they have that labeled out. But what they also snuck into this bill is that K through third grade or a, uh, not age appropriate, uh, which they had to not label. So at any point, a uh, parent can say, this is not age appropriate in fifth grade, or this is not age appropriate for my seventh grader. And that um, because of that, that kind of loosey language, it kind of leaves a lot for um, interpretation. And with these bills, you kind of don't want that kind of interpretation because it, it impacts a lot of a lot of people. Um, and they also didn't say so. We've been calling the bill "Don't Say Gay." That's kind of been a term that's been used by uh, people who oppose the bill. It, um, one of the a lot of the politicians like to say the bill does not inherently say gay in the bill, which is true. It does not say gay, but what it does say is sexual orientation or gender identity. So we know what they're trying to say, but without them actually saying it. So you're going to hear that a lot from politicians this is that we don't say you can't say gay, but it says that we can we have to limit the conversation around sexual orientation or gender identity. The second important fact is that the bill allows parents to sue a district if they believe that this measure is not being enforced. This goes to the first one, it's age appropriate, but it's not being defined. So if a parent, if I'm a parent of, if I have a fifth grade child and they're talking about um, um, an all gender restroom or a gender neutral restroom, and I feel like that's not appropriate for my fifth grade child to sue, I can bring a lawsuit to the school district. It seems that's a very expensive thing to do, very time consuming thing to do. Like what you're thinking, like what parent would actually do that? The fine print is that the lawsuit will be at the school's district expense. So this is no, this is no out-of-pocket cost for a parent. So if a parent, and they can stand to gain a lot of money from someone who's worked in school districts before. I know that they get sued all the time by parents who feel that they have not, uh, their school, their student is not being um, taught the correct way. A lot of these lawsuits are just like in, in the state of New York, they've just been like wiped away because like New York state has a really, they they detail out like what can be discussed in school. But here with that kind of loose language, it's gonna leave for a lot of parents to, to sue if they think that the conversation around sexual orientation has gone too far in their, in their child's school. Um, so that's the fine print. So the third fact I wanna talk to you all about is that how the this, this bill prohibits school support, uh, support service personnel from withholding information regarding a school's mental, a student, sorry, a student's mental, emotional, or physical health or well-being. That's a mouthful. I'm going to repeat that. This the uh, this bill prohibits school support service personnel. That's like guidance counselors, schools counselors, um, any any educator within the school who has information about um, the student's mental health their emotional health, their physical health, or their well-being. Um, if you have that information, you have to tell a parent. So what the fine print means for this is that this means school counselors will be required to tell uh, parents if a student told them that they were gay or trans, um, even, if the, even if it's not a safe environment. Other school districts, such as New Jersey, New York, um, Los Angeles, have done have went the opposite way and said that if us if you find out that a student is gay you have to protect that secret or, or gay or trans you need to protect that secret because maybe the student's not ready to tell their parents maybe their parents are not okay with it and you're jeopardizing the safety what this bill says is that regardless of the safety of the student or how you feel the parent might handle this information you're required to tell that parent if you don't tell that parent they can sue you and the school, the school district pays for the lawsuit. So it's a lot of things in this bill. It's a lot of, um, it's a lot of things. I'm gonna look through the questions here because I see there's already a few questions coming in. Um, so I'm gonna just read this question out loud. And it says, couldn't people sue for having a boys and girls bathroom, uh, separate bathroom? That could be about sexual orientation, correct? To comply, wouldn't all bathrooms need to be gender neutral? <sighs> Ashley coming out with some facts that seems like it will be correct that seems like it will be right right but it's unfortunately in the way that they have written this um 
they wanted to keep it in the binary system of having a boys and girls bathroom. But I understand exactly what you're saying. And that is literally my exact argument. Um, we tell, we say we don't want to teach about, um, actually, I'll get to that because I'm going to, I'm very lopsided on this argument if you haven't tell, couldn't tell already. So I'm going to get to that uh, in a second when we have some time for questions. But um, so I want to talk about some of the supporters of this bill who say like this is the way it should be. We should not, uh, the don't say baby gil bills get uh, good. So one person said, um, Senator Dennis uh, uh, Baxley, who's the bill sponsor, wrote, uh, putting emphasis on gender identity encourages kids to try different kinds of things. See a lot of head, head shaking. A lot of, um, <laughs> um, another one person said, you might know, know this person. It says, it basically, say, it's saying that our younger students um, to our students, do you really want them being taught about sex and this is any or any sexual stuff, but I think clearly right now we see a focus on transgenderism telling kids that they may be able to pick genders and all of that. And that was our gov our lovely governor here, uh, Governor DeSantis. Um, <laughs> um, I got a fun fact about ba uh, uh, Bexley, sorry, Bexley, he's a literal mor uh, mortician. That's a little scary. Um, and also a job that is, um, has really, really, really good job security. Just in, just in case any of you are wondering what to do for any, and you will go into college. Um, it is a profession that's dying out, no pun intended, but it is really good job security because that's one of the, the things that is promised in life is that that will happen. Um, so opposers of the bill, people who say that this is bill is going to be a bad thing that we should not look at this, we should not pay, um, we should not put kids through this bill. Um, the Trevor Project, which is the nation's largest LGBTQ resource um, uh, for suicide prevention, um, says Florida's don't say gay bill will mean that LGBTQ students won't be able to talk about the most important parts of their lives, their families, their parents, their friends, their identities. Um, a statement from the White House that uh, President uh, Joe Biden posted says today, conserv today conservative politicians in Florida advanced legislation designed to attack LGBTQIA plus kids instead of making growing up harder for young people. Um, in instead of making growing up harder for young people, the, pre uh, the president of the United States is focused on keeping schools open and supporting students in mental health. And that was a statement from the White House once the bill passed the, um, the Florida House. So as you can see, there. Are, it's, this is a divided issue. There's some people who are saying that, um, who are defending this bill, saying that we don't want to teach transgenderism to our kids. We don't want to talk about sexual orientation or um, LGBTQ issues within schools. That should be up to the parents to decide when. And then we have people on the other side of that argument uh, who are opposing this bill, saying that we should have these conversations because it can create a level of inclusion. It doesn't stop not saying, not having conversations about LGBTQ individuals does not stop the conversation from happening. It just stops, it stops, it stops it from being a safe space for those students who need that, that conversation. So there are both sides to the argument. Um, maybe some of you lay on either one of the sides. I'd like to hear from you later, later about that. Um, but um, some facts just to keep in mind, um, these are facts pulled from the Trevor Project um, after COVID. So these are very, very recent facts. Um, every year, the Trevor Project releases their annual data. They get they um, interview a ton, tons of schools throughout the United States, and they report back with this data. So right now, we know that 42% of LGBTQ youth seriously attempted suicide, um, attempted considered attempting suicide in the last in the past 12 months. That's 42% of LGBTQ youth. Um, more than 80% of the LGBTQ youth stated that COVID-19 made their living situations more stressful. Personal note, you all, um, I cannot imagine, and I know there's some LGBTQ folks on this call, and I like salute you all being part of this LGBTQ umbrella myself, cannot imagine what it would have been like to be in quarantine with my parents. Um, for many reasons, but but the main reason being that they were not affirmative, affirming of my sexual orientation and school was my outlet and was my place that I sought, sought comfort uh, and to get away from all that stuff. And I had, um, I wasn't even out in school, but I like, like I had gay people that I would talk to and like, and, and learn from. And 
it was just like a place where I felt like I can be as free as close to being as the person that I wanted to be as possible without having to like hide and and lie about who I, who I was being. Um, another fact from the Trevor Project is that only one in three LGBTQ youth found their home to be LGBTQ affirming. Um, I share with you my story. It's not. I was. I would hope that the numbers were were better because it's a you all are a new generation, but it still seems like that their their homes are not still. There's still a lot of parents out there that are not supporting their their youth, their students, their kids. And which makes it even more prevalent and important that schools have um, our safe spaces where young people can come together and have these conversations. Um, just on a side note, we cannot talk about don't say gay without talking about the Stop Woke Bill, um, which bans the teaching of critical race theory and also DEI work as a DEI professional, DEI being diversity, equity, and inclusion, as somebody who uh, does this work, uh, this bill that is being passed and, the, and is going to be probably signed into law, kind of, it, it really affects the work that we do trying to talk to young people and, and adults and older people. I even do stuff with uh, nursing homes on diversity, equity, inclusion, and the importance of having different voices at the table making decisions. Um, if you ever have had been in a circle or been in a conversation where everyone looks the same, everyone has the same, you know, like everyone in that circle has, um, looks alike, comes from the same background, believes the same way, prays the same way, prays to the same God, you notice really quickly that there are not a lot of new ideas coming in. So we talk about a lot of the work that we do is talk, was we talk about the importance of having, um, diversity in spaces. We talk about the importance of having equity and equitable practices in corporations and, in, and not just having those, but also having people to feel included, having young people to feel included and, and giving them a sense of belonging. Um, this bill, the Stop Woke bill, uh, bans those conversations from happening uh, in schools and, cut and, and it's not just K through three there, it goes all the way up to the college level and then even in organizations. Um, so that is happening in the state of Florida. Just another bill to watch out. That one is House Bill 7. It's labeled the Stop Woke Bill. Um, running sh um, a little bit sh short, I had like so many other things, but uh, I know you all are super active, active and you wanna know like this bill is gonna be signed into law. This bill is going to be become a thing in schools, how it's gonna affect us is still unseen. And I would really like for us to come back maybe in a few once this bill is signed in to see what, um, how it might affect us. Um, there's some optimists out there who think that maybe it won't be a big thing. Maybe it'll just be like, it will maybe, I'm pretty, I'm usually an optimist, but I'm not optimistic about this. I think we're gonna see some really big implications on what this means. I think, um, for all of you, for anyone here that's on the call who uh, may be part of the LGBTQIA plus community, um, A, I see you, I believe you, I understand you, I've been you, I am you, <laughs> um, and have been you. Um, so I get the, the struggles. Um, and I know that we've made this world such a, like, despite bills like this that are passing, we've made this world such a more inclusive place. Um, already. So I know it's going to be really, really hard to like take some steps backwards, especially for those K through third graders. I've seen kindergartners coming to their teachers and saying, hey, I'm trans or hey, I don't like girls or I don't like boys. I don't know what I am or I don't know what my gender might be. I don't feel comfortable this way. Um, so I know those conversations are happening and I know those conversations are going to be stifled now because of these bills. Um, so what you, you so what can you do? What can you all do right now uh, to make a difference. Um, number one, you can reach out to some local and national LGBTQ organizations who are already trying to fight the fight here in Florida. Um, there's Equality Florida. They're super terrific. PFLAG, they're national and they're also local. They're local chapters in every, pretty much every um, metropolitan, metropolitan area. The Trevor Project, that's the nation's largest LGBTQ uh, resource um, place for suicide prevention. You can volunteer time you can you can talk to someone if you're feeling down or or you can volunteer in different ways many different ways uh project no labels that's another cool uh, nonprofit. that's a national nonprofit. 
Um, another way to get a, get to do, get in, get involved during this during this uh, thing is to get a hold of your local government representatives, whether that's your congressman, whether that's your um, senator, whether that is your representative, um, even your city council people, and tell them how you feel about these topics. There's power in like voices. Um, I feel strongly about certain things. I've always felt strongly. I didn't realize how much power local government has. Local government has like the power to really like make changes within communities. Um, also understand, this is the, the probably one of the more important things. Um, understand that this and other bills may affect others more than you. We may not feel this as much as other people. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not being felt. Um, again, these, this, this don't say gay bill is tar um, written to target uh, K through K through th third grades, but like we might, some people might feel it in high school, some people might not. Some people have very supportive families that allow them to be themselves. So don't think that it's not affecting mass people. Um, so host local conversations, do get on Zoom, get on like have these conversations with people, ask people how they're feeling, check in with those younger people who are in these younger grades and see what you can do to make a change, what, what you can do to make, make a difference. You all are still really young. So you're probably in touch with some of your elementary school teachers or your middle school teachers. Um, this, a lot of this falls back onto them because they're not allowed to have these conversations anymore. So maybe you can help them and you can reach out to them and see what kind of support you can give these teachers and these educators. Um, Cause they're probably scared too, right? They, they don't want to get sued and and potentially lose their jobs or or be sued by an angry parent. So think about that. Um, that is all the time I'm going to take. It's 7.02. I went a little bit over, but it was what worth it. I'm going to look at this chat box right now and see what questions came in. Oh, someone said to the LGBTQ students, please know you are valued and you have allies. Uh, NAMI also values all voices, diversity, equity, inclusion. Thank you for that. Um, I think it will be a major talking point um, I guess that's during elections. Yeah, I think so too. I think that this is going to be a huge talking point. And if it's not, um, maybe we should consider making it a huge talking point. Um, let me see. I think that's it. Yeah. Um, so think about, take that, take this. I'm going to pass it over to Milani, I believe. But I want you to all think about what you can do in your communities to make a difference and what you want to do to make a difference, even if it's a small, small, small thing, it can still make a huge impact. I'll stop sharing. And with that, I'll pass it back over. Thank you, Eric, for your amazing presentation. Some of these bills, like the Stay Woke bill, it really does get under my sleeve because how are we gonna just gonna stop? Okay, let me stop before I go on my mini rant. Um, next, I'm going to introduce Will Larkin. Hopefully I'm saying your name, your last name correctly. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Larkin, um, yes, but you were Larkin. very close. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, high school junior Will Larkin is heavily involved in the opposition against the Don't, gay, don't Say Gay Bill. Will is a part of the executive board of Voters of Tomorrow Florida and is the president and co-founder of Winter Park High School Queer Student Union. They are one of two organization, organizers of the walkout at Winter Park and even received national attention after testifying against the bill in front of Florida's House Opera. Um, operations committee. So listen up and be inspired by Will's story to take action and stand up what you believe in. Hi guys. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much for having me um, and giving me a way to communicate with the youth. Um, I am a junior at Winter Park High School. I know that at least uh, I was told that maybe there would be some Winter Park High people here, but who knows. Um, I have been involved in the fight against uh, House Bill 1557 sort of since the beginning. It started with, um, I, you know, I run the Queer Student Union at my school. And so it started with having meetings in conjunction with other um, activist clubs, specifically the National Organization for Women at our school, where we would have all of our club members we would walk them through the steps of emailing representatives who were planning on voting in favor of the Don't Say Gay Bill uh, 
and we met, we also did calls and, and emails uh, to senators. And then it led to me going up to Tallahassee to meet with legislators um, and actually talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, Republican and Democrat, about how the wording of the bill would affect people like me or affect would have affected me had it been in place when I was younger. Um, I am non-binary and very outwardly gender non-conforming. And because I feel inherently more comfortable dressing non-conforming and, and presenting non-conforming, uh, it's, been, it's been obvious like that I'm like that since I was really young. Um, you know, I was sort of, it, it, it was obvious by kindergarten, I'll say, like I was wanting to dress like a girl and play with girls toys and, you know, the whole ordeal, but I went to a private school and they never, I was never exposed to the queer community. I was never told it existed. Um, I was never really, like I never had hateful parents or anything, so I knew I was safe, but I thought I was broken. I struggled a lot with just identity and not really knowing who I was. Um, and that's, that's my fear for this bill is that people like me who are growing up will not be able to either one, safely have conversations they need to with teachers. And two, this is just going to prevent queer education that needs to be in schools. You know, they let a lot of, uh, people in support of the bill like to say, oh, well, we shouldn't have these discussions about sexuality and gender identity in schools. First of all, it's not inherently sexual, but second of all, yes, we do. We need to be having these conversations in first grade because I was struggling with my identity in first grade. So we need to be telling kids, hey, there's a community out here. And if you're feeling different, you're not the only one and it's okay. And that's something that we need to be telling kids. The, the thing about this bill that's really terrifying is it's not just about, it, it, it goes deeper than what's written into the actual bill. Uh, there's a larger issue at play here. Um, when I went to testify in front of the Senate's Appropriations Committee, um, I talked about my personal experience, what I just told you. I talked about my close friends who had been kicked out of their homes and had to live homeless. Uh, one of my best friends actually was kicked out of his house in November and had to uh, live with me for a couple weeks before um, before his parents like changed their mind or whatever. Uh, so, so I talked about all that. And then I talked about the Trevor Project's statistics. You know, queer teens are four times more likely to commit suicide. Queer teens make up 40% of the homeless youth, while only 5% of the general youth. You know, there, there's statistic after statistic that shows that there is a mental health crisis within the queer community. And there is also statistic after statistic showing that queer education in schools is the solution to this. And I was one of hundreds of people who testified and not just testified, but met with these legislators and told them these facts and told them these personal stories. And they looked us in the eye. Well, they didn't look us in the eye. That's a lie. Sorry. They uh, looked away from us, but they heard us and they, they ignored it and they chose to vote in the bill anyways. They, they know what they're doing and that's their goal. It, I don't know how many of you saw this, but today Marjorie Taylor Greene said, um, I want Pete Buttigieg to take his electric vehicles and bicycles and uh, and him and his husband need to stay out of our little girls' bathrooms. Uh, and then I don't know if you also saw this, but Ron DeSantis, our governor, uh, his press secretary went on Twitter calling this an anti-grooming bill. I'm 17 years old and I've been very out, outspoken in opposition to this bill. And I've been getting hundreds, if not thousands of messages and comments calling me a pedophile and a groomer for speaking out against this bill. And I think this plays to the larger issue of conservatives trying to regress, not just LGBTQ rights, but human rights. Um, they know they're killing queer kids. They know that, that's, that this bill is going to hurt us. Uh, they know exactly what they're doing and they're gonna do it anyways. Um, I'm trying to remember which legislator it was, but one of the conservative uh, representatives, I believe, said, it's not the don't say gay bill, it's the don't turn my son into my daughter bill. They know exactly what they're doing, and it's disturbing. Um, last year, Ron DeSantis cut funding for LGBTQ mental health uh, support in schools because they want to kill us. And the reason that they're pushing this narrative that being queer is inherently uh, perverse or 
is uh, the, equating us to predators and groomers and pedophiles. The reason they're doing this is because they want to bring back a stereotype that we have been fighting so hard to destroy, that trans women, gay men, uh, gay women, trans men, queer people as a whole are inherently perverse. Th this is one of the reasons that so many queer people get killed. Uh, this is why our homicide rates are higher. And this is a, a lot of the homophobic messaging in in anti-LGBTQ ads from way back when, one of the main themes was queer people are groomers, that being gay is the same as being a pedophile. And now they're writing that into law. And when you spread this narrative and when you spread this idea, it incites violence against our community. And that is what they're trying to do. They're inciting violence against us and then removing our mental health resources and then furthering an uh, uh, an identity crisis that we're already 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 going to go through. So it, it's been disturbing to sort of be on the front lines of this and and see it from from the perspective just of uh, as a queer person being involved because the hateful stuff they say it's it's terrible and, and it's not just Florida. Uh, Georgia also filed a similar bill to 1557, and, and I'm sure you guys have seen the god-awful stuff having, happening in um, Texas and Mississippi. So this is just the beginning of a larger issue. And it's also the second Parental Rights and Education Act. The one last year also attacked trans people. It just didn't do it well enough, so they did it again. And if this one doesn't work well enough, they will do it again. And it's not just the LGBTQ community that they're working to keep systemically oppressed. Um, they're working to, to, to hold up these structures of oppression over every single marginalized group. People assigned female at birth, um, BIPOC folk, immigrants. Um, there have been bills attacking absolutely every one of these groups. We mentioned earlier the Stop Oak Bill, um, House Bill 7. Getting rid of education about the reality of, of what's going on in America I, I, we're told this since we're, since we're so young. The reason we have history classes so we don't repeat our mistakes. And they're trying to censor the history about um, racism in America because they want to go backwards, because they want to regress. They want to hold up these systems of oppression. And it's disgusting. Um, and then there's the, the abortion ban they just passed. It's a 15-week ban with no exception for rape, incest, or human trafficking. This is just the beginning. This is the first of many bans until it's completely illegal because that is their goal and it's not just florida and and i don't know if you've also seen this house bill 1467 was actually um signed into law yesterday um this bill will would allow anyone in the world to challenge any book in any uh public school library in florida because they want to censor our our access to information and I just, I'd like to ask, who else can you guys think of in history who burned books? Hitler, literally Hitler. And that is, that is their model. That's what they're trying to do. And it's so messed up. They're, they're, they're getting rid of our education. They're, they're attacking our education. They are getting rid of protections that queer people have and holding up these systems of oppression. Anyways, uh, I don't know how much longer I'm allowed to talk, but I'd like to say one last thing before I um, dip. Um, you can get involved. You don't need to be organizing walkouts of 500 plus people or testifying in front of the Senate to get involved. Um, there are so many resources to teaching you, uh, sorry, you can figure out who your reps are, who your senators are, who represents you. And if they're not representing you properly, you can email them, you can call them. They have to, they have to by law, read every single email and respond to it, listen to every single voicemail. Um, that is how you get involved. If you, have a, if you have a representative or senator or a person in power that does represent you, help them get reelected. The midterms are this summer, if you're 16 or older, you can pre-register to vote in Florida. And uh, even if you can't vote, if you're not 18, like me, I won't be able to vote in this election or the governor's election, but I will be out on the streets canvassing for Ana Escamani, who's my representative. And I will be canvassing for uh, Carlos Smith, who 
once the redistricting happens, will be my representative. Um, figure out who your politician is, figure out what their values are, and if you like it, work with them, support them. Uh, you can do texting, text banking, calling. It's You can do most of it from home, uh, attend their events. And if you don't like them, write a letter. Tell them how you feel. Um, thank you so much for having me. Well, that was absolutely amazing and truly inspiring. You did make a great point about how history tends to repeat itself, even though they try not to. They've always been trying to censor us and they always will. But that's something that we always have to continue to do. Um, now is the time that we're going to be taking any questions that you guys have from the chat. If they flow in, me and Leslie will be helping filter the questions that you guys have. Um, I don't see any right now. So, Will, I do have a quick question for you. Go for it. So, I understand you're a junior at Winter Park High School. I'm a sophomore, Dr. Phillips, you know. Oh my God, um, represent. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, my question was what did you start with? If you just wanted to get your school involved, for example, the Don't Say Gay Bill protest, we did have that at my school and I did participate as well. And it was really interesting to see all the different people in their opinions. So how do you recommend on starting something if people like me, allies, or other people in the Zoom or people watching want to do to start? What do you suggest? Um, well, the way that I was able to successfully pull off a walkout um, was doing it through my club. If you are in charge of a club at your school, you have um, a little bit more power within the school, not just socially, but uh, with the administrators. So I started the Queer Student Union in November after a series of hom homophobic attacks against me and my friends um, that the administration completely ignored. And we decided, you know, if, if this is happening to me, this is happening to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not like a fluke, you know, it, it's been happening on a regular basis, so I can't be the only one. Therefore, we need a union to protect and empower the students at our school. Um, if there isn't a club such as Queer Student Union or uh, an activist club or a now club or a feminist club or whatever, any of, any, any of these work because the issue here is very intersectional. So whether it's a you know, feminist club or Queer Student Union or a Black Student Union or whatever, you know, um, <laughs> get involved uh or if there isn't one start your own find other people who are like-minded and want to make change and find a sponsor um next week we're setting up voter registration booths at a and b lunch for the entire week um and anyone 16 or older can pre-register it's it, it is a little bit of work but it's it's not not as complex as you'd think and because i had my club i was able to go to uh, the principal with my friend, Maddie Zornick, who's the president of the Now Club. We, we sat down with him, we said, hey, people are talking about doing a walkout. We wanna be able to lead it and we wanna be able to do it safely. And our clubs can get the word out there and make sure it's organized. Um, and so we had our officers on patrol. I made everyone take a de-escalation seminar from a, from a, pro, from a protester who, or a, sorry, a, uh, what is it called? An organizer who's been doing it for forever. Um, so yeah, that, that's how I started. Uh, just networking, get to, get to know the other people who are, who are in the same boat as you. But, but really, if you, if you have a club and you have a group and you, you know, we have 30, 40 people attending our meetings, advertise, you know, get it out there. Because we have that small base, word of mouth gets it out really quickly. We have a remind with like 50 people that go to our school. I can text something and then 50 people see it. That's great. 50 people in a school of like 3,000, you're able to start something pretty quickly. That's my suggestion. Definitely will be taking that suggestion. Um, our next question is for Eric. It states, so what should the message be during the midterms about these bills? How do we show this is an issue that affects everyone? Yeah. Um, I definitely think, um, to answer the second part first, um, how do we show that it's an issue that affects everyone? I definitely think having allies stand up and 
voice their things, voice their concerns and voice their frustrations with the bill. It's one thing to, um, it's one thing to for to hear it from the LGBTQ community. It's another thing to hear it from allies. We know that the presence of LGBTQ individuals only enhances everyone's experience. Uh, and we know that at the, um, the Trevor Project, I quote the Trevor Project a lot, so pardon me, but uh, the Trevor Project did, actually, actually this is a GLAD statistic, GLAD, uh, G-L-A-A-D, uh, did a survey, a student survey, uh, that showed that the presence of a GSA club reduced suicide ideations across the board in school. It created a, a better sense of community within within schools once a GSA club was added to uh, schools. So we know that that's needed. So just using your voice to make sure that they know that it's just not from this community. I think there have been very few movement movements, if any, in our history that has been that did not need and depend on heavy support of people in privileged situations. So realizing that if you're an ally, you may not be part of the community, but you have a privilege and you have the, the you you have the, you should, you should have the desire to want to speak up for those who are underprivileged and who are being uh, harmed by this bill. Um, and the, the message for the, part, second, the first part of the question, it should be really clear that this bill does more harm than good. There's no, I think, Things were going really, really well for LGBTQ schools, and we were headed to this really progressive place. And then I think people who are fearful, um, a lot of bills, like these bills that have happened, not just this one, but the, the abortion bill, the CRT bill, um, they are created from a place of fear often. Uh, people feel like, feel like they're losing control or they're losing power or they're losing their status. And... Um, so they create bills to keep people, keep marginalized groups marginalized, keep minority groups the minority. Um, so just you, understanding that, understanding why these bills are created, and understanding that like we need to start electing people who, who are part of those pe part of those marginalized groups, right? Because they're not they're going to understand better than than anyone else. Thank you for your answer to that question. So it was a great answer. Um, our next question is, what are some models of education done well? This is not really a question specified to either of you guys. So if you guys have an answer and are willing to speak, floor is yours. Will, see your hand up. Okay. Um, so while I didn't unfortunately learn about queer people growing up, I had a fantastic education uh, on racial history. I went to a hippy dippy California school. Um, and even though they didn't talk about queer people literally ever, uh, we learned about the harsh realities of uh, living as an enslaved person. And we learned about um, basically every, like the history of racism in America in like second grade second or third grade, I don't remember. Um, but that included history to this day. That included police brutality, that included Trayvon Martin, uh, that included um, the explanation of the N-word being reclaimed. Um, history doesn't stop 50, 60, 70 years ago. It, it goes until now and then now, and then like it, it's, go, it's as we speak, history is happening. So schools need to be teaching all the way. Um, and that's what my school did. And because of that, I had a, even though I lived in a very predominantly white area, in a very predominantly white school, I was at least educated on the current situation in America in regards to, to um, racism and such and if that and we also learned about the holocaust in the same way and jewish people to this day and then same with the women's suffrage we've literally just never heard about queer people though lol but um if we were to have that in all schools you know it would reduce the hatred that minority minorities have to deal with both internally and from peers a lot of a lot of the you know, homophobia and a lot of the hate crimes, I don't know how else to put it, and like bullying that I've encountered from first grade all the way to like yesterday um, 
a lot of it stems from literally just not understanding. A lot of people think being queer is a choice still, like purely just miseducation. And when people don't know some, when, when human beings don't understand something, they get scared and they attack. It's literally like inherent nature. That's what animals do. If you have a cat and it doesn't know what's going on, it'll get scared and attack because that's because we're animals. So we need to be teaching about these communities from a young age. We need to be teaching queer people as a fact of life, not as like, okay, kids, we gotta have this conversation now that it's seventh grade. So there are gay people. No, 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 it needs to be a fact of life from birth. And, and, and that's, how, that's, that's how it could be done and how it should be done. Thank you. I completely agree with you, Will. Like, yes, snaps all the way, all the way. Okay, another question we have. I love all the questions that we're getting, guys. It's like a great conversation. Um, what is the impact of this on college education? How are they affected? Yeah, um, you're all so young, so you haven't been to college yet. I think there are only maybe a few of us who have gone there. Um, but I could say as a as an educator, um, I think it's putting a lot of stress on people who are entering the teaching profession, um, who want to enter the teaching profession. We're seeing that there's a critical, critical teaching uh, shortage around the country right now. Um, when you put these implementations on what a teacher can and cannot do, um, there's already so much structures that a teacher has to live by, uh, follow with the standards. You all know about the Florida standards and all this stuff. Um, Teachers have to like, you know, like study those standards and memorize that. Now you're telling them what they can and cannot teach on top of that and what they and how they can and can't support a student. That doesn't feel, and from an educator, from somebody who loves working with young people and where to loves teaching high school, um, it's a reason also I got out of high school because I couldn't deal with like the pressures of Florida high schools and and not and not being able to support kids the best way I knew how to support kids, the way that I knew I needed support in schools. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that we're seeing. I also think that like we're seeing, we're going to see kids who go into college with that same trauma, that same trauma of not being able to be accepted for who they are in grade school, in middle school, in high school. And now they're going to be entering college where they're supposed to be free to find their communities and everything. And they're not going to know what to do. And, um, and it's going to be a really unfortunate, unfortunate event, um, I think that um, there's another question that just popped up in the chat, and I'm gonna uh, saying that these can these bills be challenged because of free speech? I think so. I think that like you know we're gonna see that during the midterm election. I'm there's hoping. Liter there's already a lawsuit being filed. Perfect. Yeah. Um, Where can I speak? Because some things need to be said. Yes. Yes. S speak. Speak. <laughs> it's. Mm. I don't want to go over my time because we have two minutes left, but it just seems yeah. if there's, there's like Will was bringing up, there's this fear and fear is the enemy, but instead of looking at it as the enemy, can't we see this as a learning opportunity for our, our people everywhere? Let's take this as a learning opportunity instead of being scared because there's no reason, but <laughs> Sadly, our time is up. I want to thank everyone who showed up and participated in our event this evening. I also want to thank Mr. Vaughn and Will for taking their time out of their busy schedules to talk with us. The Holocaust Center also thanks you all for being change agents in our community just by simply joining our Zoom call. Um, the center is also inviting you all to come to our Uprooting Prejudice event with Daryl Davis, which is happening April 1st at the Holocaust Center from 5.30 to 7.30, followed by Community Shabbat with Matzo, Ball Soup, Shalat, and more. I hope to see you all there. Tomorrow, we will post the, we will post the recordings of tonight's event for you to share with others. And I think, oh, Leslie already has pulled up our slide. So thank you guys so much for joining and I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.